Mike Holden here, and we're going to have a discussion. And this is all things psychotherapy. So, you know, many times people will say that psychotherapy is very distinct from breath work. Is there an overlap? Could breathing be embraced there? And I'm intrigued about psychotherapy, touch wood. I haven't had to, to embark on that route, but many people do. Many people get great benefit from it. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have a, a kind of a, you know, see how, see how the conversation goes and find out a little bit about what you do, Mike. I know you're based in Clock Jordan here in Ireland. You live in an eco village. You came from the UK a number of years ago. And uh, I'm going to pass it on to you. So just for starting off, just a little bit of background. What sort of clients do you work with? Who comes to you? Um, what sort of problems do they come with? And just from that, and how long have you been working with in psychotherapy? It's all yours. Okay, thanks very much, Patrick. And just to start off by saying it's really nice to be here and to be doing this uh, podcast with you. I, I listened to the one you did with Tom Heron last week, and I thought it was great, and I thought it was a really nice way to feed into what we're going to talk about today. So you, did, you didn't feel it was a competition or anything Tom, um, between yourself and Tom, no? Well, when I saw you had him on, I was a bit worried. But no, in actual fact, it was, um, you know, I, I learned loads from it. I loved the bit where he talked about having the client walking in the snow. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought, God, I, that, 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 that's a brave thing to do, you know. Yeah, it is, especially with, a, with a, 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 somebody who's after coming out of, out of jail and, um, you know, with, with a history of drug taking as well. And, you know, you, you never know the frame of mind, so... When Tom yeah. asked somebody to take off their socks and walk in the, in the sub-zero yeah. temperatures, it's, uh, it's interesting. But here you go. There's a, one of, a very famous psychotherapist who's written lots of books, uh, Irvin Yalom. He has a phrase that I love. He says, uh, create a new therapy for every client. You know, so, and so what, what he's saying in that is that, you know, it's a relational thing, psychotherapy. So we, we meet the client where they are and if we can be creative about that and, and if we can you know be spontaneous then it's going to be great it's going to support the client so so i just thought that was an excellent example of tom just being brave enough to say right i you know he, he just obviously had some hunch about what needed to happen there and, and off he went so you know, and in doing that he created a relational space where they could then work together so i, I thought that was great i really did yeah so, so intuition seems to play a significant role. If, if you're talking face to face with somebody, um, even despite the training and despite the theory that people have learned in their profession, those hunches can be really important. I would say so. I would say so. Yes. And that actually ties into um, you know, what you just said about that, despite your training, you know, is there the flexibility? I think that ties into really the nub of this because at the end of that podcast with Tom you asked the question you know why hasn't psychotherapy embraced breathing or you know or has it or what's going on there and so um yeah because there are schools of psychotherapy and there's a history to psychotherapy and so I think some of the reason might be actually embodied in that so if we were to go all the way back to the early days and Mr. Freud uh, with his beard, you know, now who knows how much of the, the cliches, you know, the therapist, interesting, this kind of stuff. But without a doubt, it was psychotherapy. It was the therapy of the mind. And of course, he was into psychoanalysis. So you were sitting there and you got, you know, you talked about your dreams and the idea that you were going deep, deep, deep into the mind and the, the psyche. And, and out of that would come, you know, a, a sense of healing, a sense of well-being. So, you know, you, you can see there, you know, very, nothing there about giving people uh, instructions about breathing or anything like that. You know, just, just absolutely, we are dealing with the mind. And it's even known as talk therapy. That would be the kind of uh, term for psychotherapy. It's a talk therapy. And so you could argue that when you start diverging from that, you know, is it psychotherapy? Is it the pure talk therapy? So that would be, I suppose, a historical reason that, you know, our, our roots are very much in listening and talking and, uh, and that interaction between people. And then and the, the, the client who comes into you, what <clears throat> in today's modern age, I'm not sure how long you've been working in psychotherapy, Mike. In today's modern age, are the issues today any different than they were 15, 20, 30 years ago? And um, what are the more common issues? 
Um, mm. And what's your opinion on why? Is it just that they are coming to the surface that they've always been there? Is it that people feel, you know, a greater willingness to seek help whereas in before? And men's mental health, I'm always intrigued. Men are very mm. reluctant to, um, we are the most vulnerable in terms of mental health. Mm. Women have better st coping strategies. And um, yeah, just a little on that. Well, interestingly, I, I get a, a lot of male clients, you know, and I think that's probably because I'm a, a male. Well, I'd, I'd say there's, there's two sides of it. It could be that some women are, are less comfortable coming to a male therapist. So just statistically, I end up with more men. But I also think that, uh, you know, some males, certainly they want to come and see a male counsellor because there is that idea that maybe they'll be understood more. So there is this mm -hmm. uh, relational thing. And so, yeah, maybe as a male counselor, are the things that people bringing in, have they changed? Well, I think the human condition is fairly constant. You know, we, we struggle, we struggle. So, you know, I mean, a very basic model of the, the human experience is there's mind, there's body, and there's relationship. So, you know, I have a mind, that's where my sense of self resides, but it's, it's embodied. So I need this body to carry it around and that's how I interact. And then there's relationship. And so of course, what do people come in for? They come in because, because their, their, their mind is unsettled or because they've got physical ailments, which are unsettling the mind or, you know, the, the relationships are causing issues. So, so that and those things are totally interrelated there's no way that you can really separate them but you know the map isn't the territory there is some benefit in thinking in terms of mind body and relationship so um so i no, I, I don't i my guess is it hasn't changed that much and mm -hmm. in in some ways there's always going to be some anxiety there um, people generally unfortunately i might add but people generally don't decide that they're feeling great and so they'll go and get some psychotherapy to see if they can feel any better. You know, they come because there's a dis-ease. Mm -hmm. And, yes, and yes. interestingly, they, they, they think that the, the mind has brought them in, but actually it's the body, it's the dis-ease, it's the, it's the sense of, you, know, you could call it trauma, but it doesn't have to be trauma with a big T, but you know, there's just something that doesn't feel quite right and that's affecting the way they think and mm -hmm. they, they reach out. So on, on that level, I don't think much has changed, but there's no doubt that our society at the moment has specific pressures. Everybody is super, super busy. Um, there's lots of people who've got stress because of finances. And if we go back to that relational side of it, you know, possibly, now you could argue this, but you know, with the advent of social media, with the advent of everybody being so busy, you know, possibly the relational field has been really compromised. I mean, I, I used to live down in West Cork uh, before I moved to Tipperary. And t 20 years ago down there, uh, you know, I would happily go and knock on a neighbor's door and just, you know, or even shove it open and go in for a cuppa or whatever. Whereas now you'd nearly feel you've got to ring up. You wouldn't just turn up on someone. You know, yeah, necessarily. Yeah. It's really changed here in yes. Ireland, I think. And, you know, some parts I'm sure of West Cork, because I think every time... West Cork is a lovely place to go to. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to attract a particular type of individual. People yeah. who are a little bit left to field, people who haven't followed, you know, the, the, the same path. They've, they've traveled a path different, which is nice. I'm, yeah. in the, I'm on that path as well. And there's yeah. something really fascinating about it, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah but the, the whole relational thing, I don't get that. What does that mean? Relational problems. Is it, is it person to person problems, wife to husband problems or? That kind of thing, wife to husband, uh, child to parents, sibling rivalry, or just the boss, the boss at work. How do you deal with a boss that's bullying you? Mm. That can be anxiety provoking. So re when I say relationship, I mean w relationship to other people. And this is, this goes back to the core of psychotherapy. That there's um, you know, psychotherapy is, it's a science, but obviously it's quite hard to get data on it because it all happens in closed doors between two people and you're relying on self-reporting. But one area that is really, really well mapped out and studied is this idea of attachment. So when babies, you know, when you come into the world, you attach to your primary caregiver. 
and that's um, that's you know via the air, via the eye contact. It's via hugging. It's via skin contact. It's via the tone of the voice, um, and it's about reciprocation. So you know the, the the baby smiles and the caregiver. Let's say it's the mum smiles back. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you just smiled then when I said mm -hmm. it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, and that is what the relational field is about. So we are not, you know, I mean, scientists used to have these ridiculous theor or, or philosophers about brains in baths and things. Brains you know, in? Brains in a bath. Could you have a brain? Oh, in a bath. Okay. Yeah. And th the answer is, well, you could, but it would have a very different kind of consciousness because our, our sense of self is actually formed in relationship with others so basically you're lying there and you you know as a, as a very vulnerable baby and you smile and mum smiles back okay you cry and then mum does this she goes oh what's the matter and and you can see from her expression that there's care there and then they soothe you change the nappy and then you smile again and mm. that's all gone okay mm. now that that is good attachment okay that's what's meant to happen and then as the child gets a bit older it becomes a toddler and you'll see this so they'll they'll toddle off and they'll go to the sand pit and they'll look over the shoulder and mum's still there and that that's called a secure base and so from the secure base the, the child moves out into the world but the point is you know this is so fundamental this is how they develop the sense of self Okay, in relation to other. So there's a, you know, there's a, there's a whole thing you can talk about into subjectivity. So at some point, the toddler realizes that, hang on, mom isn't smiling because she's happy. She's smiling because I'm happy. But mm -hmm. at other times, she's not smiling because I'm happy. She's just smiling because she's happy, independent of me. And so sometimes it's mirroring and sometimes it's her being independent. And that is actually how you develop a sense of self, that there's a boundary to me here, that, um, you know, I, I am separate to the rest of the world. Okay. So, so nurture is, is vital. I don't know if you ever watched that film, Three Identical Strangers. I was on a flight going over to the States and it's fascinating it stuff, isn't it? I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard about it. But this is where we, we could even talk a little bit about the breathing, I mm, think. So sure. well, hang on, there's so many avenues we could go down. But if, if the attachment's going well, that's how it's working, okay? But if, if I get left to cry and nobody comes to soothe me, that's a very, very frightening thing because I'm not getting that relational soothing. And so what can happen then is I can just learn that there's no point crying because... I'm not going to get anything from it. And so there's a, there's a shutdown takes place. Okay. Like what is yes. the point of me crying? It doesn't get a reaction. And then everyone says, Oh, isn't that great? You shouldn't spoil them, leave them crying, you know, mm. and because look, they stop eventually. But you know, I, I, I would say, you know, that that's, that's not a good, that's not optimal. That's and is there a certain age? Is there a, for instance, um, give the give the child a lot of comfort when they're crying up until a certain age and then if the child you you think it's regardless of age well you see you have to separate the behavior from the person so up, up until the age of two two and a half it's unconditional because they don't they're just learning like a, a two-year-old isn't really responsible as such they are just learning they're responding to their environment and they're learning now mm. there comes a point where you know you have to say don't touch that it's hot okay mm. and, and you might have to raise your voice to do that okay but we're not the child isn't bad that's the point mm. so then we have to start separating the behavior from the child so it, it can be i've asked you really i you know I, I need you not to do that in the future and and if you do it again there might be a consequence but that's a behavior it's not you're a bad person for doing that mm -hmm. it's about mm -hmm. it's about the behavior and see what this is doing is we are embodying a sense of how safe the world is that's the important thing is the world a safe place can i take my place in it am i valued or is that not the case? Is the world somewhere I have to be a little bit on my guard and defended about? Okay. And you see, this is where I think some of the breathing could start to, to come in. Because if that two-year-old is learning that the world is a dangerous place and it's scary 
and I'm actually not getting the, um, the response that I need from my environment. Nobody's soothing me. So, you know, and it can happen anywhere along the line, but you know, th then the cortisol levels, the adrenaline levels, the, the child is going to be slightly in flight or fight because it's, it's very, you're very vulnerable when you're a two year old, mm -hmm. you know, you're relying on your caregivers for everything, for, for, your, for your very survival. So if those needs aren't being met, of course, there's going to be the potential for a flight or fight response. And of course, that could set up the bad breathing, <laughs> the hyperventilating, because you know, the, the, all the, the stuff that Buteco is so good at explaining. And it's very, very possible that those early experiences set up um, bad breathing, you know, because if the neurological circuits learn that this is how I breathe, then that's maybe how I'm going to carry on breathing. So this yeah. is, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. I don't claim to be an expert in this, but it would yeah, kind of make yeah. sense, wouldn't it? That, yeah. That, yeah. 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 No, I think so. I just changed the camera view there. <clears throat> I think so. Um, there's many things that can impact breathing, especially in children. I think part of it is going to be genetics and there's no doubt that behavior is part of it and stress the environment that the child is, is growing up in. Um, mm. And mm. hyperventilation then, as you know, and as I know, the mm. impact that that's going to have in contributing to anxiety, because number one is that our breathing is fast and our breathing is shallow. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really amazing that the most primitive part of the brain, which has developed over hundreds of thousands and possibly millions of years, that it can be tricked in terms of every time throughout our evolution that we get into a stressful situation, we, we always breathe it fast and shallow throughout mm. our evolution. Mm. But we never breathe it slow when we were stressed during our evolution. So the limbic part of the brain is always associating fast and shallow breathing with fight and flight with stress. And on that basis, then, when we gently start slowing down our breathing, mm. we are telling that part of the brain that everything is OK. Yes. And I think breathing exercises have a huge role to play because mm. I'm not sure, you know, I know you're a Buteco, um, you're trained Buteco instructor. And the people that I come in, they have. I have people coming into me and also online, people with panic disorder, anxiety and depression. I'm always intrigued looking at their breathing and mm. it's very much fast and upper chest breathing. And always at the back of my mind, I'm wondering if these people continue to breathe like this, it's feeding into their symptoms. Mm. And um, that's why, you know, I think it's wonderful that as a trained psychotherapist that you have embraced breathing because, mm. and I'm, I'm looking at breathing from a number of different dimensions from the biochemical, the biomechanical, and also coherent breathing, which will be taking into account Stephen Purge's work, um, mm. vagus nerve and heart rate variability. And mm. I think that's the depth that we need to go down. Mm. That, um, so, so just in terms of breathing, then, do, do you notice you know, typical patterns of people coming into you? Um, do they be mouth breathers, nasal breathers, fast breathers, shallow breathers, diaphragmatic mm. breathing? What's the typical pattern that you see? And also, people with anxiety, do they breathe a little bit differently to people with depression? Have you noticed that? Or? Mm, that's an interesting one. Well, first of all, I should tell you that the, the place where I see most of my clients is two stories up. So everyone's out of breath by the time they get to <laughs> <laughs> including me so I'm, I'm often saying like just you know would you want to just get your breath back before we before we do anything and and of course so I don't know if that helps me or not because a lot of people would be mouth breathing when they've made it up the stairs in place so that's uh you know but th there's no doubt that breath well in in my opinion and what I've observed that the, the breath plays a role in this I mean it must do it mm. just has because of all the stuff that we know about um, oxygenation of the brain and having enough carbon dioxide to do that. Yeah. So um, I, I try to bring it in now, absolutely. You know, yes, so, yeah. uh, um, and, and just to come back to, hang on, where are we going with this? We yeah, were talking to, about the child before yeah, I went off on a tangent. Exactly, so I just want to finish just in case this is relevant as well, because the child is mimicking so much and because uh, these things tend to be intergenerational in terms of the attachment. If that primary caregiver isn't breathing well because mm. they're anxious, and let's face it, raising a child can be anxious if you're a very balanced 
you know, stable person. But if your own childhood wasn't great, or if you're, a, you know, if you're struggling, you're a single parent and you haven't had any sleep, it's entirely possible that the primary caregiver's breath is not going to be optimal. Mm. And so if, if mum is going <laughs> like this, then th the child is going to learn that. So, you know, I, I think, you know, because we do so much of this mimicking that I think there's a, there's something possibly that actually you know you're, you're saying that a lot of it's genetic and I would I'm sure that's true. Well, no, it's but partly think, it's partly it's definitely influenced by genetics. Yeah. Yes, but and environment as well. Be, yeah, environment and that could very much be to do with just modelling and mirroring, just copying basically. So yeah, that, yeah. That's um that's part of it. So okay, I think we can that that's that bit of it done anyway. We've got that. Just yeah. a question that's not related to breathing, um, yeah. but say for instance somebody is born to an alcoholic father, mm -hmm. and the alcoholic father there's a lot of turmoil in the house and a lot of aggression and things like that. Mm -hmm. The child who's growing up there, they seem to either go one or two ways, but but they're more likely to follow the pattern of the alcoholic father. Mm. But then I'm sure that some children they go completely the opposite that they they absolutely don't want to go near alcohol. Mm. Do, what if what do you have any idea of the percentage of people or what would you know the tendency when we were exposed to that in life, um, mm. how that can direct you know it, it's like a kitten. I remember we have cats out here in the countryside and sometimes they wander into us, and some cats will come near me, and other cats won't come near a human being. Mm. And later I was told that if the cat was petted in the first two to three weeks of their life, they will always come near a human being. They will feel comfortable coming near a yeah. human being. Okay. But if the cat during the first two, three or couple of weeks, it's a very short period of time. Mm. If that cat wasn't, if the kitten wasn't petted by a human being, yes. well, that cat then will remain, they will remain distant from human beings for the rest of their life. It's really, okay. it's fascinating stuff. Mm. So our environment that we are born into, that we have no choice over, mm. and how that can impact Absolutely. our life. And that's the attachment window. So it's more than a few weeks with, with humans. But the first couple of years are seen to be crucial because the brain is wiring itself. You know, all the, the, all the connections are being made. And deep down, you're just making this decision. Is the world a safe place? Can I trust the people I'm relying on or not? You know, so that's the bottom line. And why do some go on to copy the dysfunction of the alcohol? And why do some, uh, mm. well, I mean, I think that can be very much down to just chance encounters. You know, I mean, I, you hear stories that, you know, it was this scoutmaster that just provided a totally new role model for me and I could just see a different way. And, uh, you know, and you, you kind of, you, 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 they call it introjection, but you kind of take people on. So you know you kind of hear their voice in your head, and they and so it depends what your influences are basically. So and, and again, that might be uh, a, a part of the problem that when we were a bit more tribal, you know, the, the I and, and I don't even mean back to you know real tribal. I just mean in a in a West Cork village where Granny was next door and Auntie was around the corner, and you were being raised by more than a pair of stressed out adults. You know that that totally. That you, yeah, so I think that might be the problem. A part of the problem is that it takes got... a village to raise a child. Absolutely. So, so grand's looking after the kids while you know mum and dad are in the fields or whatever it is, and the the, the children are getting more input than just mum and dad. So, mm. if the only input is the alcoholic father, then that is the role model. And you see, kids become really defensive. Like part part of the survival strategy for a child because they are relying so heavily on the parents is it, it's too painful to imagine that the parents are no good because then I'm really in trouble so a, a better workaround is to assume I'm the problem like my parents are all right they must be okay I must be the problem and and we take that on board and we carry that that I am somehow the problem which is why you know you, you, you end up in therapy or just being an alcoholic or whatever and so but people can be quite defensive that no, no, I had a good childhood, you know, and so you know, so that I think that could be part of it. That there's a reluctance to admit that parents were bad sometimes, you know. So. And when you have one of these people sitting in front of you, so you're there telling you their story, 
Hmm. And you are then, your role is then, is it to give you a different interpretation? Is it to reframe it? Is it to break it hmm. down? Um, hmm. What happens? Well, this is where different, you know, different schools of therapy might have different answers to that, but I'll give you my answer. So, you know, I believe that the, the key to all of this is living an examined life. Okay, I think, was it? What do you mean? Not, well, an examined life is that rather than just being Mike and getting on with being Mike and being very busy being Mike, that I kind of step outside myself and I look back in and I say, what is it like to be Mike? You know, so that this is introspective awareness. And I, I believe that two of the best tools for introspective awareness are psychotherapy and mindfulness meditation. So when we can take a step back into introspective awareness, I think people do it in a very superficial way. They wake up with a hangover and they go, why do I keep doing that? <laughs> well, that, that's introspective. And they're not going to do it again. I'm not, but of why course it I, happens the following day. Exactly. But why do I keep doing that is actually a very, very deep question. Why do I keep doing that? So psychotherapy is about holding space for that inquiry, basically. Why do you keep doing that? That's, tell me. You know, so so it's um it, it's cultivating people's ability to have introspective awareness and then steering them down that path of looking inside okay and and again that might answer part of the question as to why many therapists wouldn't then switch and say well let's do some breath work because mm. You know, if you're a, you know, Carl Rogers humanistic psychotherapy, it was very much just holding the space and allowing the client to explore. And you wouldn't want to leave them anywhere because you would be disempowering them. Mm -hmm. If I start giving the solutions, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of shortchanging you of your journey. But also it might not have long term effect because then you become reliant on me and I become the, uh, the father figure who's got you know, the, the answers or whatever. So, yes, you know, so, yeah. so some schools would say no intervention and just, just hold the space. Uh, other people would be more, um, more prescriptive. Mm. So, you know, for me, I would feel that I wasn't being congruent. If, if I was sitting on a fantastic bit of knowledge about breath, mm. I think I would be doing the client no favors at all to not. Well, I would, I would rather go to you, to be honest with you. If I would rather choose your approach any day of the week. Yes. And you could be saying I'm biased, but I know even from the literature, we know the effects that hyperventilation is having. We mm. know the effects that upper chest breathing is having, and we know the impact it's having on sleep. And, you know, if sleep isn't right, how on earth can the mind be right? Yeah, but there, there, was a, there was a study conducted back in 2010 by a Dr. Moret, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. And she looked at, there were two groups of individuals. One group where they were prescribed slow breathing with the aim of normalizing carbon dioxide in the blood from a biochemical point of view. Mm -hmm. And the other group was pro provided um, cognitive behavioral training. Mm -hmm. And they found that the only intervention that changed respiratory physiology was the slow breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. And she spoke about that CBT, which is of course, it's going to be very beneficial for people, but it doesn't change respiratory physiology. So the people are still in that fight and flight from a respiratory point of view yeah. and from a physiological point of view, because the brain is in that state of agitation, you know, and we know that from research back in 2017, that there's a part of the brain spying and breathing. So mm. I think it's tremendous that you as a psychotherapist have brought in di these different modalities. And I absolutely wish that there were more mm. psychotherapists like you because yeah. they are very few and far between. And I say that because I'm 20 years in this field mm. and we have a handful of psychotherapists out of maybe a thousand instructors worldwide between Oxygen Advantage and Butecno. Mm. You know, that there has been a reluctance in psychotherapy to, to embrace breathing. Mm. Um, and, that, you know, people might be saying I'm being critical of psychotherapy. I'm not. I'm just saying this is just my experience of it. Well, I mean, we are embodied. The, the brain, there's definitely, you know, it's all a bit confusing, but there's definitely a connection between the mind and the brain. And we are embodied. And if the brain isn't getting oxygen, that's not going to help the mind. But I mean, really, a lot of psychotherapy, I believe, is about stabilization and resourcing. Okay. So before you can go diving into someone's trauma 
from you know what their alcoholic dad how their mm -hmm. life was we I, I believe that it's about stabilizing and resourcing in the present before you can do any of that and so there's an acronym that i use i think i got it from uh, a therapist called judson brewer who in the states but there's this uh, an acronym seeds okay so the, the first s is social but what's your social circle like are you mixing with people who are a positive influence on you or are, you know are they a negative influence on you and then the one of the e's is education so that's very much about all of this kind of stuff so their psychoeducation is what you would call when psychotherapists explain the theory and stuff that's psychoeducation and so i would be very free I mean, possibly too free with psychoeducation so i would talk about breath and i would talk about stabilization and the flight or fight mode and getting into the rest and digest mode and all this um, the next e is exercise absolutely critical as you know so we we need to get moving we need to mm. we need to get the body moving because the, the then the brain's going to be better and and clearly i would be encouraging exercise with the nose closed sure. <laughs> the extra advantages and then you've got diet which is critical and no need to say any more and then you've got sleep which is fundamental as well and and again i would um i i would recommend to, i i wouldn't beat around the bush i would just say you know, from what you've told me, you know, your anxiety is worse in the morning. Coincidentally, you've got a dry mouth and, uh, and your partner's really annoyed that you've been snoring all night. So, you know, mm. I, I, I honestly think, you know, please, would, would you give this a try? Tape up for a week. Yeah. Let yeah. me know how you get on. Okay. So the seeds. So if, until you can do anything else, the seeds need to be planted. Mm. You know? That's so, excellent acronym, actually. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. I didn't come up with it, but I like it. And um, I, it, it just works. It just works. And, and if you've got those basics, then you can move on to, to, to healing your life and, and doing a better job. But, um, but really, you know, it would be a bit crazy to, it's a bit like, you know, there, there is a school that says, you know, that I would be, reluctant to work with serious addicts because that's a speciality you know and in some ways it's it's the antithesis of psychotherapy so there's there's no point coming to me on tuesday if you're going to get drunk on wednesday would be mm -hmm. one school of thought now i'm not sure i entirely agree with that but it's but along that vein if the, if the brain's hyperventilating yes you're going to be anxious at a physiological mm. level yeah regardless of other things that we can really look into like yes that must be horrible that your boss is bullying you and you feel you know it sounds like you feel trapped because you, you have a mortgage to pay you know so you're that what's that like to feel trapped and so we can do all the investigation into what's actually going on in the mind in the body with the emotions in a supportive relational environment um, but why not get the breath sorted first to, to get the bedrock you know yes, and of yes, course yeah. and, and and i can use that as part of the relation building so in the same way that the mum regulates the child you know mm. you can bring the breath we, we can we can regulate each other's breath it will fall into rhythm if we're in the room together and and i'm saying that sounds hard yeah, mm. yeah. you know and my hand goes on the heart then you you, you you bring people into regulation by your presence so that would be um Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we there's currently one instructor. He's based in Canada, Tyler, mm -hmm. and um, he's working with a lot of veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, with addictions, and a lot of these are addictions, not just to alcohol, but um, to opioids. And mm -hmm. really, the feedback from him is that it's making really good progress. That's from mm -hmm. a breathwork point of view, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. That by changing breathing patterns, that it's also feeding into. Um, reducing addiction and I've no experience with working with that field so I can't comment but yeah it's, it's um, it kind of opens the door for maybe addic uh, people with addictions okay. um, that breathing because I can only imagine I know when I was doing mindfulness courses back in 2010 I had quite a few people I was doing short two-hour courses and had about 2,000 people come in over the course of about two years or so but the people with a lot of anxiety had great difficulty meditating, tremendous mm. difficulty. And they get very frustrated with it. It would bring on a fear response. When mm. I do the reduced breathing with them, it would bring on a fear response. And I learned a lot from it that, as you said, we really need to be tailoring everything 
according to the individual. Yes. And I made mistakes with teaching breathing exercise with people with anxiety mm. because I would expose them to gently slowing down their breath mm. to the purpose of improving or increasing carbon dioxide in the blood, which generates an air hunger. But some of them had a very strong sensitivity and alarm response to the increase of, of carbon dioxide. Mm. So, you know, it's, a, it's amazing that how, you know, how complex the human mind is, how yeah. complex anxiety is. Mm. But, but yes, you know, we can tailor, we can change to suit yeah. these individuals as best we can. I think that there's a great potential there. Absolutely. And I did want to come back to that point that you were saying, why hasn't psychotherapy embraced breath work? Mm -hmm. And I think to some degree it is doing now. So, you know, there's lots of um, uh, kind of superstar psychotherapists out there running courses on the Internet and stuff like that. And all roads lead to Steve Porges, basically, and, sure. uh, and the polyvagal theory. And so it, it, it is really, really being embraced. So um, I'm just thinking there's a, there's a fellow called Peter Levine and he works very much with trauma in the body. And if you read his stuff and if you listen to how he works with clients, you know, he knows about slowing the out breath, about getting the vagal break to, to stop the sympathetic nervous system. And uh, it's all there, it's all there. Even that, you know, he has people but the, you know, he has them breathing slowly. He has extending the out breath. Now, strangely, nobody that I can find ever says breathe in through the nose, but mm. I'm assuming that they do. Like, I can't imagine. Well, can't. He, <laughs> I can't imagine he would have someone sitting in his office gasping in through their mouth while he tried to calm them down. So I, I think the fact they haven't mentioned breathe through the nose is probably just. Oh, Mike, you know, I will guarantee you if they haven't mentioned breathing through the nose, they are not giving it much attention. And right. here, is, here is the reason right. being. Yeah. <laughs> and the only reason I say it is because many people assume that it doesn't matter whether we breathe through the nose or mouth. And I'll mm. give you an example. Um, I had an operation on my nose back in 1994. Mm. And I went in because I had chronic nasal obstruction. Nobody told me to breathe through it afterwards. Okay. I've sat in medical conferences and I've heard doctors talk about it doesn't make any difference between breathing through the nose or breathing through the mouth. I had a professor of medicine who, mm. who objected to what I was talking about, the importance of nasal breathing. Mm. And I spoke about the functions of the nose. And then I was supported, luckily enough, by Dr. Kevin Boyd, who is an anthropologist and a pediatric dentist from, from um, Chicago. And he, he stood up and he spoke about the importance of nasal breathing. And I just mm. want to show this because I often use this, and this is the anatomical model. So here we have the nose itself and here we have the lips. Mm. And if we breathe air in through the mouth, that air literally goes straight down the throat. There is yeah. no defense. Mm. And yet when we look at the size of the nasal cavity, so it's, lovely, it? it's, it's amazing the amount of space like this here and what we see in our face, maybe about 20% and the remaining 75, 80% is going back into yeah. the skull it's incredible it's incredible because i love that model i mean i don't i haven't bought one of those yet but i hold up a picture of that and mm. people are just they are amazed to know they've been walking around their whole life and they didn't realize there was this big cavity yeah. between their mouth and their brain i didn't you know like, yes I, I, yeah i've got one of those wow yeah yeah <laughs> yeah no it's amazing and i think the big point here mike is it's like it's not just the breathing exercise say for instance if we have a client in front of us Mm. And I'm teaching the client for 20 minutes. I'm giving them breathing exercises. It's not just their breathing while they're sitting in front of me. We want to know, and you know, mm. how is the client breathing when they walk down the street? How is the client breathing when they are in bed at night? How is the client breathing when they get into stress? How is their everyday breathing patterns? And even looking at Stephen Forges, you know, in terms of stimulating the vagus nerve, slow breathing is mm. really, really vital for that. And typically between 4.5 to 6.5 breaths per minute. But nose breathing is naturally slow breathing. Mm. And nose breathing is better connected to increase the amplitude of the diaphragm. So we breathe lower. And when we breathe with increased amplitude of the diaphragm, we mm. typically breathe slower. So, exactly. but 30% of the population have rhinitis. Their nose is stuffy. And uh, unless you show people how to decongest their nose, Mm. Unless, you unless we educate them what to expect when they switch from out to nose breathing, that if they have air hunger, decongest mm. their nose, gently slow down their breathing, the air hunger goes in time, 
Um, mm. And I think this is where breathing, because a lot of people say they teach breathing exercises. What are they teaching? Well, exactly. And, and mm. are they scratching the surface? And also, what dimensions of breathing are they targeting? Like, are yeah. they looking at breathing from a biochemical point of view to increase mm. blood flow and oxygen delivery? From a biomechanical point of view, to get, mm. get better engagement of the diaphragm for, for improved control of emotions and slower breathing mm. for improving heart rate variability. We mm. really need to go into that depth with people with anxiety, uh, PTSD, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. So they are, you know, I, I do believe that's happening with people like um, the people who follow Steve Porges, you know, loads of really wonderful stuff out there. And, and yet the fact that nobody mentions the nasal part of it it's just, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? You know, that that isn't more... Because it, don't give it any consideration. I know. You know, if you, if you feel that the nose is important, you're going to talk about it. Well, I think anyway. Yeah, yeah. But isn't it, it's just bizarre, isn't it? And uh, I mean, I find this bizarre in, in all as aspects. Like I'm, I'm a keen cyclist, and so I kind of follow the road racing lads a little bit. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got Team Sky, and they've got this incredible you know, this aggregation of marginal gains. So they are driving trucks around with pillows and mattresses to make sure that their athletes, you know, even if only a 1% gain because they've got the correct pillow and everything. And so surely they've turned over this stone of nose breathing and nitric oxide and stuff. Haven't they? Is, is it possible? That they yeah, turned it's, over this it's stone? like people ask me the question that we yeah. work with elite athletes right. and nobody targets their breathing. I would, right. you know, they'll turn over a stone based on the, the, the support staff that they have around them. So mm. the UK cycling team, who mm. do they have there? They would mm. probably have nutritionists, they have psych psychologists, they have mm. strength and conditioning coaches, mm. but they, they might necessarily have a breathing coach. And when mm. I'm talking about a breathing coach, what are they doing? Very mm. few people do hypoventilation training and very yeah. few people are doing breath holding on the exhalation. Mm. That's something amazing that... I like, you know, and to give you an example, in sports, there were, were, was a paper published back in 2018 by Wurons, a French researcher, looking at elite rugby union players in Australia. Yes. And in four weeks, and we're talking about professionals, you know, if you can get a marginal gain in a professional athlete, it's significant. Mm. To, in, to increase repeated sprintability from 9.1 to 14.8 in four weeks, it's absolutely mm. incredible. And repeated mm. sprint ability is your ability. You can imagine as a team player, you, you're yeah. sprinting all out effort. You've got mm. a very brief recovery before the ball comes to you again. You have to sprint. Mm. And the ball may come to you again. You have to sprint again. How mm. many sprints can you do before you're exhausted? To mm. increase it from nine to nearly 15 in four weeks by just bringing in breath work. Um, so, yeah, I think this is the secret. I think there's a secret out there. And I'm going to go as far as saying it in many modalities including sports and yeah. uh those yeah. those it's at the moment it's innovators yeah. and at the moment it's people who are mm. probably applying it to themselves or coming like i came across this primarily as my own health issue mm. that's how i came across it so i came across it totally by accident and i suspect that many people have found it the same way and uh, i mean I, I just find it remarkable because if you look up hypoventilation on Wikipedia. Now mm -hmm. that's not exactly hidden, is it? You come up with this guy, what's his name? Emil Zatopek. Yeah, yeah, yes. By, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, d d why did that, you know, d d it was obviously figural in the sports world, world for a while, you know, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, anyway, yes. I, 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 breathe, I do all my running breathing through my nose, I do all my cycling breathing through my nose. And what was interesting was that, sure, I had to go backwards. It was a bit mm -hmm. frustrating because when I went from mouth breathing to nose breathing, my 5K time plummeted. Mm -hmm. But now it, it's way back w above where it would have been mouth breathing. Yes. And, and, you know, and if I do need, if I'm absolutely hammering it and my heart rate's 160 and I open my mouth, I, I can do that. You mm -hmm. know, I, mm -hmm. I can do that. You know, it's like a turbo button kind of thing. But yes, yeah, yeah. I tend not to because it feels weird. You know, I yes. don't like it anymore. It yeah. just feels wrong to be doing that. So, yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. When you break down the reasons why you should be breathing through your nose versus the mouth during physical exercise are just incredible. In terms mm -hmm. of oxygen uptake, oxygen delivery, um, mm -hmm. less trauma to the airways, 
better mm-hmm. amplitude of the diaphragm, better gas exchange, better functional movement, less risk mm-hmm. of injury. And yeah. it's, it's all there. There's papers on it. And mm-hmm. I think breathing now in the last two to three years, 2018 seems to be a catalyst, 2017, 2018, that something is happening, that mm-hmm. people are going into that detail. And Zatopek was an amazing athlete. He was mm-hmm. a Czech runner. And uh, he think he competed in the Helsinki Games, maybe 1956. He won the 5,000 meters. He won the 10,000 meters. And he never, he never completed a marathon before in his life. And he wow. decided to run it. And he won it. Can you imagine? <laughs> You've never ran a marathon in your life. You're That's at amazing. the Olympics. You decide to run it on a whim. And you I come in first. <laughs> like, part of, you know, it's, and part of his training was exhale, hold. Mm. So he was doing the same exercise that we were doing, breathing in, breathing out, pinching the nose, holding the breath. We walk, jog, run, sprint, holding the breath. And we do that to disturb blood acid base balance, but to force the body to make adaptations. Um, Not suitable for people with panic disorder, though. That's the only thing, or people with anxiety, because Mm. it would put them into too much of a fight or flight. And But for for sports, people in relatively good good health, yeah, it's good. And actually on that, just to bring it back to the psychotherapy, you mm. know, some of the advantages that I believe from, from what we are doing or what, what I'm doing is that people, you know, that anxiety is inescapable. Like, I mean, one of my punchlines, one of my catchphrases with clients is that I can't help you to not be anxious. I can help you be anxious. Okay, so we, yes. we want anxiety. You know, anxiety stops us falling under buses. You know exactly so we don't want to get rid of anxiety and if it's been in there our whole lives we may not be able to anyway but we can live with anxiety a lot better than we are and part of that is back to this introspective awareness like okay this is anxiety it, you know it feels awful but it's just anxiety i can i can cope with this so i'm widening my window of tolerance to to mm-hmm. anxiety i'm getting better at tolerating it and you see when we do the um the exercises where we're deliberately taking in less breath than we want we are provoking an mm. amount of anxiety but the difference is the client is in control yes so rather than feeling like you're the victim of anxiety it's like wow i have i have chosen to sit down and put myself under some sort of anxiety status for mm. 10 minutes mm-hmm. and you know what it's okay it's a little bit like the difference between going, oh, you know, my muscles ache because, because I've just had to work so hard or going, oh, wow, my muscles ache because I've just done an amazing run around the woods. Mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 yes. the, muscle, the ache in the muscle is the same. It's how we relate to it. And so by putting people into slight anxiety with the breath work, they are learning to tolerate anxiety. And of course, with the wonderful side effect that they are also... I'm learning that they're taking their body out of the flight and fight right you mm. know, at the same time. So it's a win-win situation, you know. So yeah. you can even say that if you were trying to categorize that, you could say it was exposure therapy. So, I, yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly what, what, what it is part of it. That mm. when, we, when we have the client slow down their breathing mm. and to the point that they are breathing a little bit less air than what they were doing before they started, Mm. They feel a slight air hunger Mm. and the slight air hunger is signifying the carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood. And Mm -hmm. most people might interpret that, that it's a deprivation of oxygen, but Mm. it's not. So Mm. I think that's one thing that we kind of have to show people that, you know, and maybe that might reduce anxiety a little bit, Mm. but also what's happening when carbon dioxide increases in the blood, but the blood vessels dilate, including Mm. the carotid arteries, which are feeding the brain with with blood flow. Yes. And not only that, but you get a right shift of what's called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, but the red blood cells are releasing oxygen more readily. So mm. even though the person is in a state of a, a tolerable air hunger, they feel that they need to take in more air, their mm. brain is actually getting more blood flow and more oxygen. Yeah. And from, that's a physiological point of view. But another aspect from a physiological point of view is that we are deliberately slowing down the breath, which in turn is having a calming effect on the individual. So yeah. it's kind of a balance, isn't it? Because you, on one hand, you have people going into, they have the air hunger, which is kind of tipping them into a fight or flight response. Mm-hmm. And then on the other hand, you're increasing blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. You're slowing down breathing, which is kind of having a, a parasympathetic activation. So it's mm-hmm. almost that we're just, we're kind of, it's like a little, you know, a seesaw, 
Um, but what you said about our exposure therapy is interesting. I actually think that is definitely playing some role. Mm. People with panic disorder, there is one subset which are very, very fearful of, the, of suffocation. And if they feel any sort of suffocation, it will put them straight into panic attack. Mm. And what we are doing is we're giving them a mini dose, a teaspoon of suffocation to yeah. train the brain that it's okay. I yeah. think it's an important part of it, Mike. Mm, yeah. And all that's happening way below the surface of consciousness as well. It's you know, like learning to ride a bike. So whilst you're in that, that, that place that you're talking about, that there's a whole reconfiguration going on. But actually, this is okay. Like you yes. say, I'm panicking, but my brain's getting more oxygen, and there's yeah. and that's that's part of raising the CO2 threshold point is yes. just where yeah. we think we can tolerate because yeah. we know we can tolerate more than we think we can. Yes, you know, yes. That, but the yeah. only way to pass the test is to take the test. So you you need to be held there for for all that adjustment to go on. I yeah, believe. yeah. So, and I always I always think it's good from for to start very because. These were the mistakes that I made. Mm. You know, I'd have, I'd have students in front of me. I'd have them to slow breathing. They feel air hunger, but some of them was really tipping them into that fight or flight. So now what I typically do is I get 30, the ones who are overly sensitive that have an overly sensitive alarm to, su an, an overly sensitive alarm to suffocation. Those students, I have them do reduced breathing for about 30 seconds, only 30 seconds. Mm. And then I give them a minute's rest to recover mm. Mm. and then I give them 30 seconds and okay. then a minute's rest mm. and I have them do that a few times on the first day the second day the third day and then we just gently build it up and mm. it was just one of those things I made mistakes too with chronic fatigue syndrome and it's kind of bizarre like we the breath the breath it's it's very powerful and um, <laughs> it's very powerful when done correctly but when it's not done correctly it's also very powerful in a negative way but um <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to, before I forget it, you, you talked about mindfulness and anxiety. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I've got, you know, I mean, I'm a firm believer in mindfulness. I've got a 30 year personal practice and I've been on lots of 10 day retreats, but mm -hmm. you're right. It, it can be problematic because, you know, because what happens when you try to meditate is that it's the relentless stream of thought which is the, the, the primary obstacle to, well, it's not an obstacle because it becomes the object. You know, we shouldn't see it as an obstacle, but thought, the, the stream of thought. And if you're already anxious, that can be problematic because mm -hmm. it just feels like you're amplifying everything. So, I, I, but again, I find that guided breathing. Now, some people don't like counting, but some people love it because when you start to count the breaths, it gives you a distraction from the thoughts. So, you know, you're mm -hmm. not ruminating. You're, you're really focusing on four in and six out. And it's... It, the time flies by you you get lost in a world of counting and yes. it can actually be really really good for so i mean i do guided meditations where um i'm i'm bringing in um a, a technique called neuro sculpting where i'm 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 saying the words like you're feeling calm c a l m and i'm spelling out calm and i'm i'm inviting the client to imagine seeing those letters so like maybe you just any crazy way you want. So maybe it's letters being drawn in the sand on the beach, or maybe it's fluffy white clouds in the sky, but C A L M. And what that's doing is it's triggering the right side of the brain because it's letters and it's the left side of the brain because it's, um, it's creative or the other way around, you mm -hmm. know, so, but, and there's this kind of tick tock and, and it's the, the prosody of my voice calming down but also you know it, it's something to focus on if you're trying mm. to draw letters in your mind that's quite a an, only humans can do that as far as we know you know to imagine fluffy white letters mm. in the sky or whatever so it's just another technique to, to bring people to allow the breath work to do its job you know so but, what you're what you're looking to do is you're looking just to bring a quietness to the mind a stillness to the mind all of those thoughts that are going through the head. Mm. Now, I had a, a discussion with a doctor during the week and um, his point was that the mind never switches off. And mm. I'm not sure if that's not my experience, um, but you know, when a person comes into you with anxiety, there may be very little gaps between thoughts and all. One thought comes into the mind Mm -hmm. And they have that thought and straight away another thought is coming in to fill that space. Mm 
-hmm. So there's no space between thoughts. Mm -hmm. Whereas I remember 20 years ago when I started focusing on my breath, of course, my mind was a bit like that because I think education does it partly. You mm -hmm. know, education is teaching us how to think, but it's not teaching us how to stop thinking. And I think there's a flaw in Western education that mm -hmm. the more we analyze and break information into tiny pieces, and the more we are educated as a society, as an individual, like mm -hmm. if you're training the individual to think, to be able to analyze, we need to be able to teach the individual how to stop thinking, to bring a balance there. Whereas maybe 100 years ago, 200 years ago out here in the West of Ireland, we were out working with potatoes, we were out working the fields, we were doing hard physical work. We didn't use our minds to the same extent. Our minds weren't trained. And I sometimes wondering, as part of the mental health issue due to the fact that our minds now are educated, that we have that capacity to think, mm -hmm. but we can't switch off. Um, so that's one aspect. But my question before I went off there is, in terms of somebody who is meditating for a period of time, mm. I know the goal isn't to bring stillness of the mind, but stillness of the mind will happen over time. Mm. in terms of the quietness that you bring to the mind. It's almost that you're developing a muscle somewhere at the back, or at least sometimes mm -hmm. I feel I bring my attention to the back of the brain, mm -hmm. that I can bring myself into pro present moment awareness by bringing my mm -hmm. attention there and holding my attention there. What's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that's certainly, that's, that, that's how it feels, isn't it? So it's, um, that's a very big question to answer because at, uh, I mean, at, um, Okay, there's definitely a sense these days that mindfulness is about stress reduction and mm -hmm. living a better life. And, and that's, that's a wonderful byproduct. But for me, that isn't the point of meditation. For me, the, the point of meditation is to try and pierce this illusion of self. And that's, uh, you know, I can't go too deep now. But certainly when you start off, it feels as if, if there is an observer and there is everything else that can be observed. So that's, that's where you're pointing to the back of your head. And that's a wonderful place to start. So instead of being lost in thought, if we can just sit with the breath, notice the breath coming and going, and then when a thought comes, we can notice that thought and go, okay, that's a thought. Label it, that's a thought, and then go back to the breath and just notice the breath coming and going. Not trying to change the breath, unless we're doing buteco, but just, just notice the breath. Mm. Breathing. And then we hear a sound. And, you know, the, the, it's the sound of a digger and that thing. So oh, I wonder if I've changed the, um, the ticket on my car and we're off on thoughts. OK, that was that was hearing. That was that was thinking. So we, we are we are we're cultivating this introspective awareness that there is the observer and then there is everything else to be observed. And that's your classic dualism. That's Descartes. And I think therefore I am, you know, so that that's this this sense that there is someone inside my head looking out and that all these things are happening around it and to it. And that's, that's wonderful, and it's a really good first stage. Um, when you get more into it, you actually go looking for that central thing, the thing that feels like it's observing. And it turns out that that's also appearing in consciousness. You know, so everything that we can observe is appearing in consciousness, including this perception of the observer. So, and then, then you get into Buddhist concepts like no self and that there really isn't an observer. You know, we're just, it's all just happening, you know. So, so it's complicated because on, on one level, we're trying to build up a robust sense of self, especially, you know, if, if people have a fragmented sense of self. But on the other hand, um, th there's nothing there really. So <laughs> it's yeah, fascinating. Yeah. It's amazing. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's great. You know, I, I'm very very, very grateful for my meditation practice and for the teachers and the guides. And, uh, and just, to, just to be able to immerse myself in that kind of investigation. You know, mm. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's what being human is about. It's about like, what is asking that question? You know, what is this, this sense of self that takes it all so seriously? You know, that I'm, I'm upset that this happened to me, you know, and stuff like that. So, yeah, absolutely. But it's amazing that the, the human mind, with all of the thoughts going through through each day, and mm. it's estimated 95% of the thoughts are absolutely useless. They're self-critical and useless. But yet we don't always pay attention to our thinking. Yeah. Um, we don't ask. And it's, you know, 
it, you know, in paying attention and, and just even observing what are we thinking about? And if we were on that pattern of thinking over and over and over and over and over and over, mm. is it making us tense? Um, mm. And, you know, it's, I know it's not always easy. Somebody did something to you. It's very natural to run it through your head. Yes. But most people and most of us are not even conscious that we are running it through our mm. head. So at least if we're a little bit conscious of what we're thinking about, we then observe the impact then that our constant thinking is having on our, our feelings and our emotions. So look, I've got a little experiment for you. Just name two films. Oh, I don't watch films much, but um, yeah, one second. Three Identical Strangers was one I gave you a while ago. Yeah. Three Identical Strangers and oh, God almighty. I'm not a film buff at all, so. Well, we'll stick with one then. So yeah. Have you any sense at all how you chose that? Well, it just came into the conversation. We were talking about nature or nurture. Okay, but, it, but and when it came into the conversation that time, you know, it's just, the, the bottom line is we can't actually even claim very much um, ownership over our thoughts. They just bubble up. You know, the, the moment you say, oh my goodness, I haven't done my tax return, okay. Ask yourself, well, why didn't it bubble up five seconds before or 10 minutes later? You know, they mm. just, they bubble up. So we're not even really authors of our own thoughts, you know, which is kind of weird, isn't it? You know, they're, I mean, they're coming from our system, but to claim ownership of them is a, is a strange thing when you actually go looking for it. You know, it's, uh, it's fascinating. You know, so, so, so I feel there's always these two levels that, of course, we're trying to, uh, and of course, that, that CBT is all about how we think and everything. And it, it feels, it's all tied up with this sense of self, you know, and free will, and it's an um, incredibly big, interesting, crazy subject, which is why I like, I like doing what I do, actually, because I can kind of focus on it more and, uh, you know, drive myself a bit potty in the meantime. You know, so. <laughs> it's just great. But in the process, so, so say, for instance, we, we bring our attention into the present moment mm. and attention is immersed absolutely in the present moment. Mm. And it's all, almost that the critical mind is put aside. Mm -hmm. The bubbles are less frequent. Absolutely. So that's why we practice on the cushion. So when you're sitting on the cushion, and I'm using that as a, just a metaphor for mm -hmm. being in that space, you're in the cushion, you've slowed down, that everything's coming in just that much more slower. So you do, you do hear the clock ding and you can go listening and you do hear the door slam downstairs or you do think tax return and you've half a chance of catching these things when you're on the cushion. Okay. And if you can cultivate this introspective muscle that can notice the, this muscle of awareness that can notice these things happening, then you more chance of catching them during the day. So, you know, I, I'll be washing up and I will just notice that I'll look down and I'll see my hands and I'll say, you're right, you know, I'm, this is me washing up, you know, there's it, in a way that's very different to just being lost in thought about what am I going to do next? I'm actually very present to the fact that I'm washing up. And if you can cultivate that uh, on the cushion and then washing up, there's a chance, only a slim chance, but there's a chance that when your partner says something that annoys you, and you can actually feel that run through your system and you can just feel that charge of going into flight or fight mode. I've been attacked here. You know, she has criticized the way I loaded the dishwasher or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. There is a chance that I can take a breath, of course, being a good you take practitioner, it's not a big deep breath like all the other therapists tell you. It's a nice small one through the nose, but I can just go, hmm. I am going to respond rather than react here, mm. you know? And so, so that's where the, that's the benefit of the meditation, apart from any wacky ideas of self and no self. It's just that if I can make a little bit of space between uh, a, a stimulus and my response, I might make a better response. And that could have consequences for the rest of my life. That's the difference between not losing a friendship or not getting sacked you know, mm. or whatever it might be. So it's if we can just cultivate this awareness on the cushion while we're washing up, maybe we catch it when the boss has a go at you. you There's two, two things that come in, <laughs> come in with that. I, I, totally, I totally agree with you. Yeah. But say, for instance, I'm in really good humor 
Mm. And uh, I messed up the dishwasher and my wife said something that you messed up the dishwasher. I'm, I'm a good humor anyway. I don't care. But, you know, mm. that's fine. Yeah. Take yeah. it on board. I messed it up. That's fine. Mm. But then if I'm in foul humor yes, and the wife says to you, you've messed up the dishwasher, it's a totally different reaction. So yeah. if yeah. we are, and you will have some people who have a tendency to be in, in anxiety all the time. And, and the other thing is with females, which is not considered, despite it being known for almost 110 year, 115 years, during the monthly cycle, um, in the luteal phase post-ovulation between days 10 and 22, mm. they're, because of the increase of progesterone, it's a respiratory stimulant. They breathe faster, breathe more upper chest. It feeds into pain. So their pain thresholds lower, their pain perception increases because of breathing because of the change to breathing and mm. the resultant change to carbon dioxide. But also, they are more prone to fatigue, they're more prone to anxiety, and they are more prone to panic disorder during this time. And you can have individuals, females, for example, during this stage of the monthly cycle, they can be diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Mm. And the other two weeks, they don't be. And this is absolutely, nobody is looking at female breathing mm. um, in terms of the impact during the monthly cycle, because I'm sure that we all breathe differently and we all react differently to carbon dioxide depending on our baseline or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so here are my two points. Somebody who has a tendency to be anxious all the time are going to fly off the handle a bit, little bit more. Yes. You, you, yeah. And it, the problem is it can be difficult in that environment because it's almost that you're walking on eggshells. Yes. And, and that's where I like, there's a guy called Dan Siegel, you know, uh, psychologist, um, clinical psychologist in America, and he termed this idea of the window of tolerance. So you've got this window of tolerance and your emotions are going up and down within the window. So if you go above the line, you're in hyper arousal and that's flight or fight. OK, so you're right. The person who's anxious, they're, they're up here. They're right underneath the line of their window of tolerance. And so it takes a tiny kick to get mm. them out of the window of tolerance, okay? So absolutely, so the point of learning to self-regulate is to, to be able to move, to, to have your window of tolerance so that you can stay within it. So if your window of tolerance is like this, it's really tight, but if you can increase it, so like, okay, so now I don't react to a comment about the dishwasher or whatever it is, I've increased my window of tolerance. So that's the idea. And of course, well, I say, of course, the other side of this window of tolerance is so if you go out of it above, you're in hyper arousal, you're in flight or fight mode. But that takes phenomenal energy to, to, to keep up there. You know, that's that's your adrenaline and your cortisol. And that's people caught, caught, caught in flight or fight mode. And that's anxiety. And then, as you know, what can happen is the other side of the vagus nerve can kick in and you have the dorsal dive. So then you, plum, you, you plummet through the safety zone of the window of tolerance. And now you're down here and you're in the freeze response. And our modern version of that is depression. You know, so, so now you can't get out of bed and you just you're stuck down here in the what's effectively the freeze response. So, again, it's about getting back into the window of tolerance. It's about it's about coming up from that place to get back into the window. And so this would be there. using seeds absolutely yes yes now working with, with depression it's it's very easy for people to feel accused like you know this is you know this is all you're making because you're not doing enough exercise so it's about treading very gently with you know accusing people of saying well you know this is all your own, your own making you know and and of course there is much evidence now that depression is linked to, to brain trauma traumatic injury so you know really knocks to the head concussions when you're a kid can have a huge effect on depression. So there's a guy called Daniel Armin in the States. I don't know if you've come across him in your travels over there. So no. he puts people in scanners and he looks at their brains and he, he looks at traumatic brain injury. And he is very, um, you know, he's quite hardcore about this. He, he, he's now saying, you know, do not let your kids head footballs. Yeah. You know, really, I mean, I mean, forget rugby or riding a bike, but don't even let them head footballs because traumatic brain injury can really have an effect on depression. Wow. So there's that side of it as well. But on, on, another, on, a, on a different level, then yes, I, I think often anxiety, you know, depression comes after anxiety. It's a kind of shutdown, you know. And so, yeah, then it's a question of saying, okay, you know, what's, 
what's what's good about the depression you know what what does the what you know it, it's kind of um it's a funny question but you know it has to be asked skillfully but what's good about the depression well you know it's conservation of energy is it conservation of people don't ask too much of me you know i'm i'm kind of i'm left to my own devices you know that that kind of answer okay mm. and, and so what would happen if if people ask stuff of you oh well i would be i'd, I'd be anxious you know I, I would then feel you know under pressure and so it is it's a kind of um it's a it's an attempt to avoid anxiety sometimes wow yeah well so, mm. um in terms of sleep people coming in i know we're going to draw because we've got probably even over it we've had a good conversation here and it's good because it continues mm. in terms of sleep the people coming into you with anxiety and depression mm. how how what's their sleep quality how are they waking up how do they feel when they wake up yeah well exactly it's a question i ask all the time and i'm poor often not always some people you see it gets complicated patrick because they people don't tend to come to psychotherapists first you know they, they tend to have been to the doctor first and that's quite right and good and proper i mean you can just imagine why because you know doctors are held in very high esteem and they you know they're great but you know often people coming in with anxiety and depression are on medication and so that's going to be affecting their sleep, you know, for good and bad, you know. So, so you're working with that as well. But yeah, poor sleep, often dry mouth, um, just, you know, waking up many times in the night, needing to drink water, and then maybe having to go to the toilet as well because they've been drinking water. So yes, yeah, starting the day in a very poor place because their night sleep's being disturbed, you know. I mean, a common one is waking up in the middle of the night and then just not being able to get back to sleep again. So because, yeah, because with insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea, the two often go hand in hand. I looked at one study, it was 67%, but they found when the two go together, depression is higher. Yes. So I can't help wondering this. If you have an individual, and we know with kids with ADHD, and if mm -hmm. you look at the work of Dr. Stephen Sheldon, Karen Bonnock, Kevin Boyd, Dr. William Hang, so many individuals out there talking about it in children, poor sleep causing ADHD. I've mm. been at conferences where I've seen medical doctors get up and say, there is no such thing as ADHD. The problem is poor sleep. Now, right. when I'm talking about poor sleep in the adult world, it's not just about sleep quantity, but it's about the quality of sleep mm. and breathing through the nose is key because, and it's even investigating sleep. If mm. somebody comes in with depression, are they stopping breathing during their sleep? Are they snoring hard? Do they have hypopnea? Do they have mm. constant sleep fragmentation? That they're, they're staying in light sleep, that they are not getting down into that deep sleep mm. for recovery. Because I know it myself, Mike, if we have a bad night's sleep, and you know, it can happen, any, of course it can happen. It's mm. almost like you're waking up at a hangover. Absolutely. And that's a once off. But mm. can you imagine that mm. we are supposed to be functioning in a productive and competitive and stressful society, especially if we're working for, say, companies where there's a lot of pressure put on employees, um, mm. that that individual is not going to be able to function. They're going to be anxious as a result. Mm. And that anxiety over a period of time is going to contribute to depression. So the sleep quality with breathing exercises and also investigating, does the person have obstructive sleep apnea? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, I, I don't feel great on the days when I've had a bad night's sleep. I'm more likely to be grumpy. You know, I'm up mm. here on the window of tolerance. I'm more likely to reach for sugar and chocolate, which is going to, you know, make my mood swings bigger and make me, you know, feel worse about myself. Oh, I've eaten chocolate or whatever it is, and less likely to exercise if I've, you mm. know, I'm less likely to go for a run on the day that I slept badly. So, so yeah. it, it's a, it's a, a, a negative spiral. Yes. Know, basically, it, it just cascades. And yeah, I'm fortunate enough that normally I can pull myself out of that by getting a good night's sleep and going for a run or doing some meditation. But if mm -hmm. you don't have those tools and if you've already got a, a predisposition, and of course, we're looking at, um, we're looking at hypoxia, aren't we? We're looking mm -hmm. at tissues. You know, we, I mean, if, if you're living in a body that is constricted because the blood isn't getting to the vital organs, mm -hmm. That's not going to be making you feel great, is it? 
you know. For sure. And, and if you're piling on junk food on top of that, so the body isn't even getting replenished, it's obviously a, a non-virtuous yeah. spiral. It's a know. total vicious circle. Totally. And, you know, totally. you're correct in saying when sleep is poor, mm. leptin, which is a hormone which suppresses appetite, that reduces, and ghrelin mm. is a hormone which promotes appetite, that increases. Mm. Yes. So poor quality sleep, we're more likely to eat more. When we yes. eat more, um, it increases fat pads, fat pads on the, the neck, the tongue gets mm -hmm. fatter, there's fat mm -hmm. on the belly, there's amplitude of the diaphragm is reduced, and mm -hmm. this increases collapse of the upper airway. So mm -hmm. it's a total mm -hmm. vicious circle. And then you feel like going out less to see people, and that's mm. your social aspect gone. You know, so it's the seeds. You know, you're just yeah. you're just pulling up. You're not you're not planting your seeds. You know, the, the sleep. They're all critical, but I think that the sleep is really, really critical. And isn't it amazing that uh, you know a, a, a two quid roll of Micropore can yes. turn your life around? It's just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. It, is. it is. Now there's people with anxiety that won't put on the tape. Yes. The micropore is, is really good. It's this one here. Yeah. And it's two it's three M one inch micropore. Mm. And then there's another, I'll just go through the different options. There's another one by a, a doctor in the States called Dr. Frank Seaman. Mm. And it's called Lip Seal Tape. And it goes like that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Um and then we have another one, Myo Tape. I might not have had it before when you were doing the training, but you did yeah, go on. Yeah, yes, I developed yeah. it for children because we were trying to get children breathing through the nose. But I didn't want to present any risk to children. Now, this is only the child size, so it's going to be too small. But for mm -hmm. people with anxiety, they're sometimes, for me, they're apprehensive about putting tape across the lips. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we put them onto the myotape, and it's gently just pressing it around. Mm -hmm. That's the kid size, so you see it's quite tight on me. Mm -hmm. But I stretched it, and mm -hmm. it's elasticated. Okay. And yeah. it's the tension created by the tape, which is bringing the lips together. So mm. if I had to open my mouth during sleep, I can open my mouth, but mm. I, it, it'll still maintain, have to maintain nasal breathing yes. um, because it's bringing the lips together. So mm. I would totally agree. Do you tape your own mouth at night? I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, I don't have any asthma. I, you know, I, I mean, I have kind of normal levels of anxiety on a day to day basis. But no, I tape my mouth because I'm guaranteed a better night's sleep. Yeah. Because I can wake up and, and I just know there's no way I've been snoring and you know, whatever else may have gone wrong in the night, it wasn't due to my mouth just hanging open. I mean, yes. what a shame if you're halfway through a good night's sleep and your mouth just happens to hang open and you just happen to start snoring. And it's just, it, it's like, well, why would I chance that? I need every mm. bit of sleep I can get. And yes. the amazing thing is that I don't even notice anymore. Like sometimes I will not notice until I go to the bathroom mirror. Yeah, and I go, yeah, oh, yeah, hey. yeah, so yeah. The first couple of nights, it feels a little bit uncomfortable, but yeah. I just do not notice anymore, and mm. I wouldn't be without it. Just no, it's, yeah. it's amazing. And mm. we've seen people, you're talking about Stephen Purgis and heart rate variability, the vagus nerve. Like heart rate variability is a measure of vagal tone. Mm -hmm. um, people are wearing aura ring, and they're sleeping with it, and when their mouth is taped, their HRV is much significantly increased which really? will tell you that you're in a better balance between the, the parasympathetic and sympathetic. Um, mm, mm, and for mm. me, after 20 years of poor sleep, going through school, going mm -hmm. through university, required to learn and study materials and society grading us on whether we are intelligent or not based on the grades that we get, mm. which is not necessarily influenced by intelligence, but is also influenced by sleep quality. I mm -hmm. had dreadful sleep. And I had really a hard time in mm. terms of getting grades. Mm -hmm. And 23, 24, 25, I can't remember now what age it was. I taped up one night after reading a newspaper article. And the second night I did it, my sleep, best sleep I had in 20 years. Mm. So, and I know it doesn't impact everybody the same way, but I would say to anybody listening to this, mm. if you're waking up at a dry mouth in the morning, mm. you're not having a good night's sleep. And if you're not having a good night's sleep, it ties into everything that we have discussed there in the last hour or so, Mike. Well, did you ever hear of anyone having a worse night's sleep for taping up? You know, I mean, yeah. just, well, it doesn't happen, does it? You know, no, it, it doesn't. But, you know, sometimes when people are putting the tape on at first, they're a little bit apprehensive, especially yeah. that one. So, mm. but no, I've never came across people having a worse night's sleep from, that's true. Yeah. And I thought your man, James Nestor, when you were talking to him a couple of weeks back about, yes, yeah. you know, he spent 10 days going around with his mouth open and it yeah. killed him, didn't it? It just yeah. killed him. So, yeah, it yeah. killed him 10 days. 
What yeah. about the thousands of children who are spending five and ten years? I was that child, mm. and nobody. And you know that's like ten days. I was just thinking, God, I would have done that in a heartbeat. I did yeah. that for years, <laughs> and nobody said anything to me. Nobody said. I even went and got a nasal operation in 1994, and mm. even despite getting my nose operated on, I still mm. kept on breathing through my mouth because mm. the, if the nose is fixed, it doesn't change the behavior. But uh, James mm. Nestor's book is great. Um, mm. For anybody listening to this again, there is a podcast with James Nestor. So he mm. wrote a new book called Brett, and it's really putting Brett on the map because he approached it from a journalist point of view and um, really well-researched. Great to see it out there because this has been absolutely breathing and functional breathing has been crying for attention. It's, mm. it's literally because... There's, the research has been very, very slow. And people say, well, if it's so good, why isn't there more research? Well, who funds research? You know, so, yes. that's part of it. There's no, apart from selling a few rolls of micropore, there's not a much there's not no. a lot of you made it. There's not. <laughs> yeah, if, you're, if, you're role, if your goal is to become a multimillionaire in life, don't start teaching breathing. It's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, yeah, but if you want to be healthy and happy, then go for it. So. Absolutely. And have a rewarding, rewarding career where you Absolutely. can see differences. Yeah. 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 Mm. So, Mike, we're going to close it. It was very enjoyable. Thanks mm. very much. Um, it was all great. And I, I hope people have got... Um, Definitely, I think definitely they will take something out of it. So very, very interesting. And even mm. for me, I was able to ask plenty of questions that mm. I normally wouldn't be asking. So all good. Mm. Great stuff. Do I get to do a plug? Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, I mean, just to, so that people can find me. You know, that's of course, all. of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, just Mike at MikeHolden.ie. So that's M-I-K-E-H-O-L-D-E-N dot I-E. So that's my website. So, and you can, you can send me an email, email via the website if you want. So, yeah. And you will have all of Mike's details. When you see the video, mm. just go to the description below on YouTube and mm. we'll, we'll have all of Mike's details up there. So if you're looking for, in terms of advice, bringing in breathing with psychotherapy, um, give Mike a call. And yeah. I can't, you know, in terms of, I think it's a great combination. Well, the, inter the one thing the CV19 did was it got me working online. So I'm, I'm quite nice. used to the Zoom stuff now for psychotherapy as well as seeing people in Great. Tiberi. So, um, yep. Yeah, so, yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So in internationally? Well, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Why not? Cool. Great stuff. Lovely, okay. Mike. Cheers, Patrick. Chat to you. Bye. Bye-bye.